Well, it's wonderful to be back with you. Uh, I've had a wonderful weekend, and uh, we've just been able to share together and learn together and hopefully grow together uh, as well. That's been great. Thank you for the warmth and the hospitality, as usual. Uh, outstanding. Um, and uh, I enjoyed a beautiful ice cream yesterday afternoon. Uh, don't normally have ice cream on a Saturday afternoon, so that was marvelous. Um, and also just been so well looked after. So it's been great uh, to be with you. Uh, thank you for the feedback on yesterday. I just had some lovely conversations with people, which have been beautiful. And hopefully all of that just helps you to uh, go a little bit further in your relationship uh, with the Lord. And so uh, I know you've been carrying on a, a, a series, doing a series together on the house of, of God, on the house of the Lord. And I want to sort of lean into that a little bit uh, with a little bit of a difference. I want to, I just feel like there's something that I want to encourage you with as we go. And so I want to take two readings from the Bible. Now, uh, they'll, they'll explain, I'll explain those as we go, but it's important we do both of them together. So it'll take a few minutes to do these readings, but it's worth taking the time to do it. And they're both in the book of Genesis. So if you've got a Bible handy, uh, then why don't you look that up? I know it'll come up on the screen, but I always encourage Christians, if you are part of a church community, bring your Bible to the church community. Uh, millions of people would give anything to have the Bible we left at home. So I encourage you to bring it, and it's always good to sort of follow it as well as hear it as we're reading together. So it's Genesis, very first book of the Bible, and we're going to read from chapter 28 of Genesis. And then we're going to do another little reading from chapter uh, 32. Now, let me give you a wee bit of context on this. So before we start the reading, just to set it up for you, um, the, the young man who's the center of attention in this story is called Jacob. Jacob has just had an interesting experience with his family in that he has, in effect, stolen his brother's blessing. So he was born a twin, but his brother was born first, Esau, and Jacob went after his brother's blessing as the firstborn, stole it from him by deceiving their father, Isaac. And then Esau essentially says, right, when, my, when our father dies, I'm going to kill you. That's the sort of background. It's like a, it's a, it's like a whole episode of EastEnders on its own, this, uh, that you could have. And so it really is quite remarkable. And so our story picks up in chapter 28 where Jacob is now on the run. He's essentially leaving home and he's going to a relative's uh, home. And we're picking that up in verse 10. So it says this, So Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. I have to say, the Premier Inn pillows were much more comfortable than that last night. Uh, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north, and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. That's pretty significant, right? When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I will return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. 
and of all that you give me, I will give a tenth. And then this will, this will not be on the screen, but it just literally says, next chapter, then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the eastern peoples. Okay, so if you can skip over, or if you've got a digital format, just press a button and go to chapter 32 of Genesis. Now, let me set the context for this. It's the same person, Jacob. Instead of leaving home, he's coming back to his homeland. And um, this is approximately, depending on how you count, it's at least 20 years later. So the story we read in chapter 28, the story we're about to read in chapter 32, there's at least 20 years between these two stories, okay? And we're going to pick it up um, in our story, chapter 32, verse 22. Now, remember in chapter 28, he was running away from Esau. Now he's preparing to meet Esau again. So this is the night before he meets Esau. So it's all cracking off here in this story. Verse 22, that night, that's the night before he's meeting Esau, Jacob got up and took his two wives his two maidservants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Everybody say, ouch. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Now that's a very significant question in the life of Jacob and it relates to an earlier event. And he answered, Jacob. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob but Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Verse 31 says, The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Now, so in our two readings, we've got uh, two episodes in the life of one person. And in both those episodes, this person, Jacob, has some sort of experience with God to such an extent that Jacob, in both stories, renames the place where this episode with God takes place. I don't know if you noticed those parallels. So this is the beauty of reading a story of a person's life in the Bible all the way through. We talked yesterday in learning how to read the Bible that sometimes we read it in sections. And when you read a story of maybe a person's life in sections, like the story of Jacob, you miss some of those big connectors. And actually, when you read the life of Jacob in one big sitting, and it would be a fairly significant sitting to read this story, what you notice is that there are, are parallel events in his life, that, that actually there's, there's this moment in chapter 28 when he seems to meet with God and then sort of carry on as normal, and then he has this moment in chapter 32 which sounds really similar to the event in chapter 28 but some significant changes are taking place as a result of it. So on the surface of it, you've got the same person meeting the same God, but we're getting slightly different responses to these two particular moments. And the danger for us is we look at chapter 28 and we look at chapter 32 and we think, well, that's sort of the same thing, right? It's the same thing repeating itself. But there are such powerful, subtle differences that it's worth noticing that actually, though they look very similar on the surface, what we've got going on here are two very different experiences. And when Jacob meets with God in chapter 28, there is a slightly different outcome to when he meets with God in chapter 32. In fact, if we were to put the two chapters together, and here's, here's my suggestion to you, it's, it's like Jacob's life journey is representing a journey from a place to a face. Okay, he's going from a place 
to a face. And what's really important is how Jacob describes his experiences uh, in both cases. So, so if we go back to chapter 28, what does, he, what does he say when he wakes from his dream? He says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. So the, the implication is that although he's had some sort of dream about the Lord, it hasn't really grabbed him in the most powerful way. He's, he's still not fully aware of what has gone on around him. And in fact, he goes on to say this. He says, uh, this place is awesome. He describes the place as awesome. And in fact, he ends up naming the place in his own language, Beth El, Beth El, house of God. Okay, uh, and what's really significant here is that Jacob has this experience with God, but his, his overwhelming view of that experience is not in the awesomeness of God, but in the awesomeness of the place. Are you with me? He doesn't say, how awesome is God in this place? He says, how awesome is this place? And it's like somehow his focus, instead of being drawn to the Lord of the place, is drawn to the place in which the Lord appeared. Are you with me? Okay. So I just want you to hold that thought, that, that actually Jacob's response here is that the place was awesome because of something that God did in that. And that's, that's one of the challenges we have uh, even as humans, that, that sometimes we can find our hearts drawn to a place and we stop there. We, we allow the experience we've had in that place to say, wow, this was an awesome place. But, but I want to suggest to you that actually what the Lord wanted to do was not Jacob to look at the place, but to understand it was the Lord of heaven who made that place awesome. And instead of just saying the place is awesome, I, I believe the Lord wanted him to, to move into something deeper in his relationship with the Lord himself so that Jacob's life could be transformed. And, and you might notice the sort of response of Jacob. We'll, we'll come back to it in a moment. Jacob sort of tries to make an agreement with the Lord. And then it says this, he just moves on. He just carries on in his journey. Even though this place was awesome, he leaves it and he carries on with his journey. Jacob teaches us a very, very powerful principle. And the principle is this, that actually it is possible to be in the house of God and miss the God of the house. Okay? I, I think that that's tucked away there. And I think if we're going to be really honest with the text, even though Jacob has this amazing experience, it doesn't really touch his heart. It doesn't change him. And I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment. It doesn't really change him. He just gets, gets taken up with the place. And, and actually, even though the Lord was in that place, Jacob wasn't aware of it. And Jacob didn't lean into it. And what you end up with is Jacob naming the place, the house of God, but actually the suggestion is, and, and some may disagree with me, so feel free, the suggestion is that even though he saw the house of God, he did not really see the God of the house. And, and that's a really important idea for us to just hold. Now, hold that thought. Let, let me go to the next thought, and then we'll wrap these together and hopefully it'll all make sense to you. If you're sitting there thinking, what is he on about this morning? Stay with me, and hopefully it'll all come together. When we fast forward 20 years later, Jacob is wrestling. It says with a man, but it's clear from Jacob's conclusion to the wrestling bout that the man was in fact God, or some sort of physical version of God. Which, which actually we believe the Lord is able to do. He's able to appear in a physical form and engage with us. And notice Jacob's reaction there. Jacob says, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared, right? Now, now note the difference in the language. 20 years before, he saw God. True? All right, he saw him in a dream. 
not wrestling. So in some sort of nighttime vision dream, Jacob saw the Lord, but what was his conclusion? The place is awesome. Now he's wrestling with the Lord, and what does he conclude? He says, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And what does he call the place? He calls it Peniel. So the first place he called Bethel, house of God. The second place he calls Peniel, which means face of God. He's seen God face to face. And actually, if we look at then Jacob's story, all the big transformations in his life take place after his face encounter, not his house encounter. All right? In fact, if you look at Jacob after Bethel, nothing seems to have changed at all. He's still a schemer. He's still up to stuff. He's still doing stuff. In fact, in Jacob's whole journey away from his home in this foreign context, he never really once engages with God. In fact, his only recorded prayer is on his way back to the promised land. So, so Jacob, after Bethel, doesn't seem to really change. But after his face-to-face encounter with God, that's where all the big changes take place. His name changes. His, literally, his walk changes. His relationship with God changes, which I'll show you in just a moment. Everything changes. Why? Because he moves, importantly, from the place is awesome to God is awesome, okay? He moves from seeing something in the place to engaging with the Lord face to face. Now, here's here's what the Bible teaches us. If you were to lift that idea and, and transport that right across the Bible, here's a principle we see over and over again, that, that if there is a special place, whether that's a physical place or a place that's represented in the gathering of a community of people like this, if there's a special place, the point of the place is always to lead us to his face. The point of the place is never to be fixed with the place, but is to understand that this place is to lead me to his face. And humans love places. We love special places. We, we, we love to, to sort of invest in the places physically, literally, whether it's our home or a beautiful building like this or other contexts that we're in. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with that. As humans, we love that idea. But we must be very, very careful to understand that, that when it comes to transformation, when it comes to change, when it comes to our world and our lives reflecting His glory, it'll never be done simply because of the place, but it will be done because we engage with his face. The place must always lead us to the face. And here's what I believe, okay? So to to keep the thing going, here's what I believe. When we engage with his face, truly see him, meet with the Lord, have a personal experience of, of revelation and grace with the Lord Jesus and encounter his presence, when that really happens, here's what it does. It changes our attitude to the place. We end up living Uh, in a much more powerful, purposeful, and productive way in the places we find ourselves, because here's what we've understood. It's not the place that's making the difference, it's his face. His face makes the difference to the place. Are you with me? So I I mean, I... I've had the privilege of being in some amazing places around the world, and I'm sure you have amazing religious places around the world, which have been absolutely staggering. I've stood in St. Peter's Basilica in in the Vatican in Rome. It's massive. It's absolutely awe-inspiring. It's an incredible building. 
an amazing place, and you could understand why people are invested in it. St. Paul's in London. I don't know if you've ever been, but it's worth a visit to go and stand there. You feel like an ant underneath the, the huge vaulted ceilings of St. Paul's. I've stood at the western wall of Jerusalem, the, the remnants of the old Jerusalem temple built by Herod that, that many, many people travel to and pray to. I, and before they closed it off, I even stood inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque on uh, that, that sacred spot that is so controversially uh, uh, considered in today's world. These are amazing places. They are incredible places. There's a sense in which, as a human, they make you feel small in the proper sense, and they make you sort of see a sense of awesomeness in, in, a, in a worshipful sense, in the, in the biggest sense of that word. But, but here's what we need to understand is that those places in themselves have no power. There's no life there. They inspire us. They, they may even bless us. They, may, they uh, you know, may do something to us at an emotional level or a psychological level. But, but actually, there's no power in the place because his power comes to us through his presence, through his face. And it's when a community like this one, a special place like this one, makes a decision, we're not just going to settle on the place being awesome. We want to press into his face. We want to seek his presence. We want to ensure that wherever we meet or whatever it looks like or whatever we have or however we gather, we are pressing on into the face of God. That's when things change. That's when people change. Because when his face is in the place, things change. When his face is in the place, actually, we change. When we have seen his face, our attitude to the place that we are in changes. And I love that. I love that. Don and I, my, my wife and I, have, have the blessing to be living in a beautiful home uh, just outside Scunthorpe, so we live in North Lincolnshire, which is an absolutely beautiful part of the world. And we've lived there just, just before the lockdown. We moved there in January 2020. The lockdown began in March 2020, remember that? Uh, it seems like a long, long time ago. And I was standing uh, in, our, in our kitchen just this last week, actually, and we were just reflecting as a couple on the goodness of the Lord. You know those moments where you just go, the Lord's been so good to us? He's blessed us, and we were thinking about our children. We were thinking about all the, the material blessing the Lord's given us, things that we never even dreamed of having. Uh, we're standing in a home that we love, and, and a home that is, is for us is beautiful. It's everything we ever dreamed of having at a sort of a physical, material level. We're so, we feel so, so blessed. And I remember saying to Dawn, and I said this just this week, I said, you know, I love living here, literally in this house. Now, Dawn and I have owned four homes together, so this is our fourth home that we, in terms of our 33 years of marriage, we've lived in four homes that we've owned and, uh, and, and this is our fourth. And, uh, and we, we stood in this place and I said, I love living here. And Dawn said something that really struck me. It was sort of romantic, but also very powerful. She said, I love it here too, but if you weren't here, I'm not sure I would love it so much. Oh, that was your cue to go, oh, that's really lovely. That, no, it's too late now. Don't do it now. You've missed the moment. That's just sad. Um, now, now there, there's, a, there's a bit of romanticism. I, I love the romantic feel of that. But actually, isn't there something deeper there? The reason the house is special is not because of the house, but because of the presence in the house. Are you with me? Come on. And, and this is, this is the, the lesson Jacob has to learn. Jacob, Jacob looks at the place and goes, wow, it's awesome. And it may well have been awesome. And his, his summary and conclusion may be absolutely correct, but that was not the point. The Lord didn't want Jacob to become transfixed on the place the Lord wanted Jacob to move beyond the place to his face. 
Now, it takes the Lord 20 years to get to Jacob, but he eventually does. And he gets to Jacob, and he eventually confronts Jacob face to face. In fact, it's the first time in the Hebrew Scriptures that the phrase face to face, panim el panim, is used. It's an absolutely beautiful phrase. And Jacob says, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Now, why is that important? Why is it important that we move from place to face? So in our study in the house of God, this is not in any way a contradiction of this because the spirit of the house of the Lord is not a fixed place, but a community of people who have Jesus at the center of that community. So whether we get to meet in a beautiful building like this, which is beautiful and we love and we want to continue to invest in, or whether we're meeting on, uh, uh, in our homes in small groups, or whether even because of restrictions we're, we're having to meet together online, that, that the spirit of the New Testament is that God invests himself not even in a physical place, but he invests himself in a community space, a, a space of gathered people in his name. So, so actually, when we gather together in the house of the Lord, we want his face to be seen. We want people to experience his presence and his grace. And why is it important that we don't just settle for the place being awesome, but we move forward into an understanding that is his face that is awesome, even as followers of Jesus? I, I, there's a couple of things I want to leave with you very, very quickly. Because, because actually... The Lord wants us to understand these ideas, that we, he doesn't want us to settle for an experience of God, but he wants us to have an encounter with him. Okay? So not just an experience of him, but an encounter with him. It is possible to have an experience of God, but not an encounter with God. Okay? So, we, so we, we gather together, we experience something, we, we get an emotional response, we experience the, the, the sort of wonderfulness of being together and sharing uh, the service together and, and being encouraged by fellowship afterwards. And there's an experience we draw off which is absolutely wonderful. We get maybe touched by a song that was sang or, or maybe something that the preacher said has engaged us and, and blessed us. They're experiences and they're wonderful experiences. And we must never, ever discount those experiences. But the experiences in the house are all a call to move into encounter with his face. So whatever, whatever you experience today in a positive way, it's designed to nudge you on beyond that experience to saying, I, I want to see, I want to engage with, I want to experience the face of God. I, I don't just want to settle for this wonderful experience I've had this morning, but I want to press on beyond my morning experience, beyond this gathered experience, into an intimacy with the Lord for myself. And so many, and this has been my experience over the years, so please forgive me if it's not yours. Over the years, I've seen so many beautiful followers of Jesus settle for the experience of God in the house instead of pressing into encounter with God for themselves. Are you with me? Now, I know this is not easy. I'm challenging you. They're not easy ideas. They're not easy concepts. But if you settle for the awesomeness of the house, then it reduces our spirituality to the experience we have when we gather, whatever that looks like, and when we connect together, whatever that looks like. And actually, that's good, but it's, it's not where the Lord wants us to stop. He wants us to draw from the wonderful experience of being together in the house so that that would encourage us, inspire us, uh, push us, motivate us to press into encounter with his presence. Are you with me? And that's an issue of revelation. I, and I want to say to you, Jacob experienced the awesomeness of the place but he didn't really know the God of the face. And, and we, we see really no evidence of Jacob having experienced God. It's, it's in fact, it seems like nothing's really changed in his world or in his life. 
Here's the second thing I want you to see why it's important. It's, it's a revelation because it moves us from experience to encounter. That's really important. The second idea is this. It, it leans us, leads us towards relationship with the Lord. It moves us from, let me say this, a sort of a transaction with the Lord to a transformation by the Lord. Let, let, let me explain that to you. That actually it moves us from a place where we want some, God to do something for us to a place where we want Him to do something in us. All right? Now, I know this is, this is challenging, but this is about moving from house to face. And, and, and we see this in the life of Jacob. I don't know if you noticed it in chapter 28, of, of Genesis, but, but Jacob's response was sort of, and I'm exaggerating it for you, but let me, let me just give it to you. He says, if God will be with me, this is, this is after the Lord's appeared to him in his dream with a letter and all of that sort of stuff. Here's what he says, if God will be with me. Now, the Lord had already promised him to be with him and do all this stuff. If God will be with me, if he will watch over me in my journey, <clears throat> If he will give me food and clothes to wear, if he helps me in my father's household, then, then, look at this, then he will be my God. Now look what's happening. It's very, very careful. Stay with me now. I know the music started, but I'm not finished yet. So stay with me. This is really, really important, right? If... If you will do this for me, Jacob says, then you will be my God. That's the wrong way round. Come on, that's the wrong way round. That's Jacob doing what Jacob's always done. He's making a bargain. He's trying to do a deal with God. He's trying to get God to do what he wants God to do instead of understanding if I truly encountered God in Bethel, then I would understand this is not about me getting God to do what I want Him to do. This is about me surrendering my life to what God wants me to do. And, and you get, so, so Jacob has experienced some sort of uh, presence of God in Bethel, but he's still making a deal. He's wanting God to do for him what he wants wants him to do instead of saying if God is awesome in this place then Lord I surrender to you now when 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 we stay in the world of experience the world of the house our spirituality rarely moves beyond trying to get God to do stuff for us what we want him to do but when we experience the Lord and meet him face to face and truly see him for ourselves the conversation starts to change to, Lord, what do you want? Lord, what's your will in my world? What would you like me to do for you? That's how we know we're moving from place to face. We start to say, Lord, what do you want in my world? What would you like me to do for you? Does that make sense to you? It's so, so powerful. And I want you to see this final idea, which is, which is really important. There is a, not only an idea of revelation, seeing the Lord for ourselves, a, a sense of relationship we move away from, wanting the Lord to do stuff for us, to asking what we can do for Him, although He still wants to bless us and do stuff for us. But then I want you to see the last little idea that actually you see this reformation that that, that actually it goes from this sense of your God to my God. Jacob moves on and he does something amazing. He eventually goes back to the place Bethel where he had been before. You can read this in chapter 35. He builds an altar there and he calls the altar El Bethel. God, the God of Bethel. Now, why is that important? Because suddenly Jacob revisits the place where he met God first, but didn't really meet him. Then he has this face-to-face -face experience with God where he changes, and then he goes back to the house of God, to Bethel, and he now understands Bethel differently because he's met with the Lord. 
and he builds an altar there. He makes a decision to put the Lord at the center there. He's making a decision that the Lord will be God there. And the place gets transformed because Jacob meets the Lord face to face. Are you with me? Now listen, Bethel was an awesome experience. An awesome experience. But the danger is, it remains the place. The Lord wanted to move Jacob from the place into a face-to-face encounter with him. Because when you and I meet the Lord, know the Lord, walk with the Lord face-to-face for ourselves, it transforms the way we see him. It transforms the way we see our world. And it transforms even our attitude towards the place we find ourselves in. Can I just say this? I'm part of a local church in Scunthorpe and I am not committed to that church because it's exciting. I'm not committed to that church because it has the best music. I'm not committed to that church because it has the best programs. I'm not committed to that church because it even has the best preachers. I am committed to that local place because I have had a face-to-face encounter with the Lord. Because my relationship with the Lord says, if I have truly seen Him, then what are the evidences of? I treat my local place, I treat the place that He has placed me in with a different mentality and a different attitude. And I make a decision, I'm going to build an altar there. I'm going to commit myself there. I'm going to give myself to there. Because it's not about there It's about His face, His presence. It's about living for Him and serving Him that is at the center of it. And Jacob makes a journey from place to face. He makes a journey from, wow, this place is awesome. And it was awesome. But it wasn't awesome because the place was awesome. It was awesome because God was there. And he makes a journey to face where he experiences the Lord for himself. And that experience with the Lord's face changes the way he behaves in his place. I don't know if that's made sense to you, but I want to encourage you, part of this wonderful Christian community that you're a part of, that actually the purpose of this community is is yes to encourage you, bless you, inspire you, in every single way, but also to lead you, to encourage you, to guide you, so that you as an individual follower of Jesus can lean into a face-to-face experience with the Lord, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that you can have an intimate, ongoing relationship with Him, and so that out of that relationship, then you and I, can see his awesomeness in this place and extend it to our world. So I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray that that will be our experience, that we won't just say, Lord, the place is awesome. But we will press on into a face-to-face encounter and be able to say, I've seen the Lord face-to-face and yet my life was spared. Why don't we stand together, if you can, in the presence of the Lord. The team will come in a moment and lead us in a song but let me just pray for you that the Lord will help each one of us Jacob has a face to face encounter with the Lord his name gets changed his walk is changed the direction of his life gets changed everything gets changed When he simply settled for experience in the house of God, nothing changed. But when he pressed into the presence of God, everything changed. And the Lord, whatever our experience in this house, wants to lead us to encounter, wants to lead us to intimacy, wants to lead us to something that will enable us to experience him face to face and out of that face to faceness there will be transformation and so Lord I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters here in this gathering Lord we thank you for this place thank you literally for this building 
We thank You for Your provision. We thank You for everything You've given this church, Lord, in terms of material provision, this wonderful place that we can gather together in and enjoy. Thank You, thank You, thank You. And we can say with gratitude, this place is awesome. We know its story, we know its history, and we say thank You, Lord, for the awesomeness of this place. But Lord, we want this physical place to be a vehicle for the gathered community to press on into your face. That Lord, we would see your face in this place. That Lord, we would experience the intimacy of your presence. That Lord, we would go further beyond the place and lean and press into the holy presence of your face so that, Lord, our lives will be transformed, our community will be transformed, so that, Lord, our gatherings will be transformed, so that, Lord, our world will be transformed through what you are doing among us. Lord, we say thank you for the awesome place we are in. Thank you for the community that we are a part of. But, Lord, we look to your face. We look to your presence. We look to your power. We look to something beyond ourselves. And we look, Lord God, to a face-to-face encounter with you that will enable us, Lord, to even not only love the place we're in, but from this place, bring blessing and life and hope and light to the darkness of our world. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will lead and guide and direct every single one of us. Whatever our experience, may we press into encounter. Lord, may we move from simply wanting what we want, as important as that is, to wanting what you want. And Lord, may we be men and women whose attitude even to this place is transformed because of our encounter with your face. And so Lord, I pray your blessing on each one of us, your blessing on this community, your blessing on the vision, your blessing on the purpose, your blessing on the journey, your blessing on the leadership, your blessing on every one of us. And Lord, may we be like Jacob. May we press from place to face and may we see your glory manifest among us in Jesus' name. Amen.